Hello, welcome back to the capnography tutorial. This is going to be part four of the capnography tutorial. Um, if you haven't watched the first three parts, I uh, implore you to go back and watch them um, and you know get caught up with the rest of us as we move along. All right, monitoring ventilation. Hyperventilation decreases entitled CO2. So think the faster you breathe out, the lower your entitled CO2 number will be. Some of the other causes of decreased entitled CO2 would be uh, cardiac arrest. We talked about how cardiac output can uh, decrease your entitled CO2 value, and cardiac arrest is the ultimate decrease in cardiac output, right? Uh, hypotension, again, same thing, a decreased cardiac output. Uh, the cold, so if somebody's hypothermic, they can have a decreased entitled CO2 value. And then severe pulmonary edema uh, due to uh, a ventilatory issue. So... Decrease entitled CO2 value, first thing you're going to think is, are they hyperventilating? Are they hyperventilating? If they're breathing at a normal rate, or if they're breathing slowly, you got to think there might be a cardiac output issue. And here you go. So hyperventilation, the faster you breathe, the uh, lower your number will become. So if you, if you watch this, it goes, this is a, a normal, normal rate, and then it's going to show that as you're increasing your rate, your value becomes lower. See that? As you increase the rate, the value goes down, 35, 32, 28. All right, so the faster you breathe, the more you hyperventilate, uh, the lower your value will be. Also, hypothermia down here. You have your normal and your hypothermic patient. It could be low value, hypothermia, low value. And that's because of a decreased uh, cellular metabolism rate. Remember, hypothermia slows down the use of oxygen. So if you're slowing down the use of oxygen, you're slowing down the production of carbon dioxide. So if you, if you slow that down, you're not going to get a whole lot of carbon dioxide produced uh, and then sent to the lungs for your entitled CO2 reading. So uh, if, you, if you decrease metabolism, you're going to decrease your uh, entitled CO2 value as well. Ventilation equals tidal volume times respiratory rate. I think we kind of uh, know that by now. Tidal volume times a respiratory rate is going to be your ventilation. A patient taking in a large tidal volume can still hyperventilate with a normal respiratory rate, just as a person with a small tidal volume can hypoventilate with a normal respiratory rate. All that's saying is it doesn't matter how much you breathe in, you could still be hyperventilating or hypoventilating, although we commonly associate a hyperventilation with a decrease in tidal volume. So what I'm saying there is, usually when you breathe fast, you don't breathe in as much. But we know like with a, a diabetic ketoacidotic patient, somebody that's got DKA, they have what's called Kussmaul's respirations, and they will breathe very fast, but they will be, breathe very deep as well. They will have deep, rapid respirations. And it's kind of, they're trying to compensate, and it goes back to what we said in part three about uh, respiratory alkalosis. They're trying to compensate for their metabolic acidosis through respiratory alkalosis, which you cannot fix that way, but they're trying to. Um, hypoventilation causes an increase in entitled CO2 value. So it's the opposite. If you breathe slower, you should have an increase in your uh, capnography reading. Other causes of increases in uh, capnography readings are an increased cardiac output. We talked about return of spontaneous circulation. So if somebody suddenly gains a pulse back when they're in cardiac arrest, they will have a spike in their capnography reading. A fever, okay? Somebody that's got a fever is metabolizing more, right? Uh, fevers are indicators of uh, people metabolizing more, so that would mean that they're producing more carbon dioxide. Pain, se uh, severe difficulty breathing, uh, decreased respirations, or I'm sorry, depressed respirations, which will be decreased rate, and... Uh, Chronic hypercapnia. Chronic hypercapnia. Who's got that? Your COPDers. Your COPD patients may have a chronically high uh, entitled CO2 due to a chronically high carbon dioxide level in their blood. All right, so here, same thing. Hypoventilation. Hypoventilation. Up top, uh, if you breathe slower, I know it's hard to tell the rate based on this. This is actually much, much slower. If you breathe slower, your uh, entitled values will suddenly rise, okay? Also, metabolism causes an increase in entitled CO2 values, 
if somebody has malignant hyperthermia, malignant hyperthermia uh, or hyperpyrexia, if you saw it on there, uh, that would be somebody, usually this malignant hyperthermia becomes an issue with somebody that you're going to intubate using RSI procedures that involve succinylcholine, which is a depolarizing paralytic, because they, they get this malignant hyperthermic state that's really pretty lethal, actually. Uh, they could fry their brain, so to speak, that's the way a lot of people put it. Um, but it produces a higher uh, capnography reading. So you got to think ventilation, metabolism, and cardiac output circulation. So monitor the trend. A steady rising in tidal CO2 as the patient begins to hypoventilate uh, can help a paramedic anticipate when a patient may soon require assistive ventilations. Like I, it drives home the point I made before. Any respiratory or ventilatory compromise, put your patient on capnography. And that goes with circulatory compromise as well. If you've got somebody with any hemodynamic compromise, I would put them on capnography. And you're going to anticipate a change in their condition much better. And trust the values. Sure, you want to make sure the device is operating correctly, but trust when it, it's giving you... For instance, if somebody is, has a sinus rhythm, they go unresponsive and they go into a V-fib on you, aren't you going to trust your EKG is accurately saying V-fib or showing you a V-fib uh, reading? You know, yeah, at first you might want to make sure there's no artifact, but if your patient's unresponsive and your monitor's showing you V-fib, you trust that reading. So if your patient goes unresponsive and you suddenly get a change in capnography values, you need to trust the, those readings. Capnography should, should be uh, used to monitor any patients receiving pain management. I made this point before. If you're going to give a narcotic, okay, remember, narcotics are respiratory depressants. So you need to monitor their capnography values to monitor their ventilations. You don't want to cause a ventilatory compromise in somebody by giving them narcotics. But if you do, it would be good to know that you did that, right? So monitor their capnography values for sure. Capnography is also essential in sedated, intubated patients. A small notch in the wave form indicates the patient's beginning to arouse from their sedation and starting to breathe on their own. We call it breathing against the vent. Uh, a lot of times they'll have what's called a Karar cleft. And a Karar cleft looks like this. It's like a simple little notch uh, on the plateau of the capnogram. So if you see that simple little notch and it's an intubated patient, you might want to uh, resedate them. Also look for other things like signs of tearing or increase in heart rate. These uh, would both indicate that the patient is in fact starting to arouse from their sedation. So you want to definitely resedate them and not cause them any discomfort. And here, if you were unable to see it on that moving image, uh, here's your Karar cleft where the stars are uh, and the B to C uh, plateau there. So that would indicate that you need to resedate your patient. In tidal CO2 monitoring is, uh, I'm sorry, on non intubated patients is an excellent way to assess the severity of asthma COPD and the effectiveness of treatment of bronchospasm. There's something called a shark fin pattern, a shark fin pattern, which shows up with bronchospasm. It's hard to, uh, it's hard to create that pattern, uh, you know, without having somebody that's actually got bronchospasm. So. In absence of wheezing, you might actually identify bronchospasm with the shark fin waveform and treat them appropriately. Here's what it looks like. It will actually cause your entitled CO2 values to decrease uh, because of this shark fin pattern. Okay, it looks like a shark in the water, uh, something you would see in the movie Jaws. All right, so he here's a couple examples of your shark fin pattern. This would, might be what it would look like initially, um, and, but it could even... Uh, go down into, uh, to something like this, a shark swimming in the water there. Um, so if you see this shark fin pattern, and remember, it's normal to have a little bit of an increase in the plateau, okay? But when you get this sharp, acute increase in the plateau, you need to think shark, uh, bronchospasm, okay? It's the shark fin pattern, and they need to get some bronchodilators. Drug overdoses, some EMS systems permit uh, medics to administer Narcan. In fact, I think most do. Uh, to the unresponsive patient suspected opiate overdose. If they've got a respiratory rate less than 10, uh, you got to suspect uh, a poss possible overdose. And 
I would just caution you, if giving Narcan, you're only giving it to improve the respiratory rate. If you innovate this patient, don't give Narcan. It's not going to help. Um, you've already innovated them. You're controlling the respiratory rate. I wouldn't give the innovated patient Narcan. If you haven't innovated them, give the Narcan slow. You don't always need to give the full two milligrams. I would highly advise run your IV line wide open as you administer your Narcan and, and push it very slowly just until you get a, an improvement in the ventilatory rate not so much an arousal of the patient because they don't generally wake up too happy. So emphysema, emphysema, uh, downsloping due to destruction of the alveolar capillary membrane. So you might see this pattern, okay? It's, it's almost a, it's, you know, mirrored, so to speak, of what you would normally see. So if you see this downsloping, you gotta consider emphysema, COPD, uh, and, and, and talk to your patient, get a good history. Rebreathing, this is sometimes called stacking breaths in the field. And the, it, what you'll see here is that the plateau doesn't change in height, but in fact, the base line doesn't come back to normal. So they're maintaining CO2 right there. You see how the baseline rises? They're stacking their breaths. So if this person's on a vent, you need to troubleshoot that vent and uh, get them to stop doing this because you don't want this to occur. That's it for part four. I uh, hope that was quick enough for you. I know we're getting into some of the more complex stuff. We're going to continue right on into part five, um, talking about a lot more of these conditions that cause alterations in capnography values. I will see you then.